Welcome to part two of the lecture series on greenhouse, peak oil and sustainable urban development. Uh, this lecture will cover uh, the issue of the consequences of climate change. We will begin by looking at climate change in a wider historical context, then look at the likely impacts of climate change, where we're currently heading and what we need to do to, do to avoid dangerous climate change. Many of the climate sceptics make the reasonable point that the world's climate has changed in the past, so what's all the fuss? The issue here, of course, is the speed of change. To look at that, we will need to see how rapidly the climate has changed in the past compared with current changes. Also, we know that there have been five major periods of the Earth's history when major species extinctions have occurred, wiping out most of the species then in existence. These have been the results of meteor impacts and the like. However, some ecologists are now labelling the current age as the Anthropocene, a period of human-induced climate change which is likely to lead to the sixth major species extinction in the Earth's history. While dramatic, we will see why this is not necessarily an exaggeration. As discussed earlier, scientists have linked CO2 and other greenhouse gases to global temperatures. And that's from a scientific theory point of view. But is there any evidence from climate history on this link? The charts above compare temperatures, CO2 levels and methane over the last 400,000 years based on core samples in the Antarctic. The first thing to note is that all three of the above graphs appear to move in unison, with, with a peak occurring approximately every 100,000 years. That begs the question, why? The answer is that the Earth has slight variations in its orbit, which means that it is on average closer to the Sun at times, every 100,000 years or so, and at other times further away. This causes average temperatures to fluctuate based on that cycle. But it gets more complex. As the temperatures change, this induces changes in both CO2 and methane, which in turn amplify the initial temperature response. Thus CO2 is not necessarily the primary cause, but it is an amplifying factor in the past cycles uh, over the last 400,000 years. Note that currently the Earth is near the top of one of its warm cycles. Note also that the natural variation of CO2 as measured over that period of history, which is way beyond human civilization, the period of human civilization, ranges from about 200 parts per million to about 300 parts per million, and that this variability takes at least 10 to 20,000 years on the way up and around 70 to 80,000 years on the way down. But in the last 100 years, indeed really in the last 50 years, we have produced a very significant change. So are we changing so we are changing the CO2 concentration roughly a hundred times faster than as caused by natural events? If we go back further into the Earth's history, there were times when the CO2 levels were much higher than the current four hundred parts per million. Indeed, up to about a thousand parts per million when the dinosaurs ruled the Earth. This was due to very high levels of volcanic activity associated with periods when the continental plates were colliding and shifting. However, these periods were much warmer than today. There was very little, if any, ice at the poles, and sea levels were much higher than now. Should sea levels reach those, those levels as, as occurred at that time, most of the world's cities would in fact be underwater. So whilst the Earth itself will survive a thousand parts per million CO2 and higher temperatures, it won't necessarily look much like it does today. And this has huge implications for Homo sapiens, not to mention other species. Given the fact that the climate does in fact vary due to natural events, how can we be sure that the current climate changes are our own fault? The IPCC in its latest assessment report five provided further evidence that the climate change we are experiencing is in fact due to human beings. It did this by modelling the changes we would expect if there were no human-induced change from burning fossil fuels, etc., compared with estimated changes when this was factored in, 
and then compared the two estimates with climate changes that we've actually measured. You can see the differences in the two sets of model results. Again, it is clear that natural causes alone do not explain what we are actually experiencing. Note that a whole range of different models from different scientific institutions were used, since no one model is likely to give us the whole picture. But note also that the models generally show a good level of agreement. So the science is actually pretty clear. We noted earlier that temperatures are rising much faster at the poles than the equator. We also noticed that we're seeing other changes such as in ocean acidity, sea level rises, etc. There are also many impacts on species of plants and animals, as well as evidence of, of more extreme weather events. Changes to ecosystems can be complex. Coral reefs, for example, can be affected by temperature, but also by acidity, as well as runoffs. Changes in the climate can mean places on Earth will get increased rainfall, while other places can expect reductions. Storms can increase in frequency or violence. In general, higher air temperatures can support higher rainfall and more extreme weather events, such as hurricanes. One of the key places to look for climate change is in the Arctic, which is covered in sea ice or floating ice. The amount of sea ice and the thickness advances every northern winter and then retreats every northern summer. Measurements over the last few decades show that sea ice in the Arctic is in retreat. Areas in summer are smaller than they were in the past and the average thickness is also declining. The combination of these factors means that we have lost around 75% of the volume of summer sea ice at the peak in the last few decades. This is pretty dramatic. Sea ice in the Antarctic, however, is increasing. This is thought to result from changes in ocean currents. The Antarctic is different to the Arctic in that the sea ice surrounds a large landmass, Antarctica, on, tip, on top of which is stored a large volume of the world's store of water in the form of ice, sheet, ice sheets. Other large ice sheets occur in Greenland. Rising temperatures in Greenland are causing the ice sheet to melt. This is different to sea ice in that the ice is above sea level, so when it melts it increases global sea levels, whereas sea ice melting doesn't have any effect on sea levels. If all the ice on Greenland were to melt, global average sea levels would rise about 6 metres. As mentioned earlier, in the Antarctic, sea ice is actually increasing. But like Greenland, land-based ice is melting, adding to sea level rise. If all the ice in Antarctica were to melt, global sea, level sea levels would rise about 60 metres or 200 feet. The photo above is one of the ice shelves in Antarctica, where the ice on land slowly slides down into the ocean. There is evidence that the rate of this is accelerating. Many species are adapted to specific temperature regimes. Changes to those regimes can mean extinctions, since plant species are limited in their ability to adapt, for example by migra or migrating to higher altitudes. Some changes are relatively immediate, others can take millennia to fully respond. Ice sheets, for example, will eventually respond to, global, to warmer temperatures, but will only change slowly in the first few decades. Hence, sea level rises are likely to take centuries to millennia to fully reflect changes in surface temperatures. These are referred to as slow climate feedbacks. Other changes will be more subtle but could be very significant, such as the thawing of the tundra in Siberia and northern Canada which could release large volumes of methane currently buried under the permafrost. This in turn could dramatically accelerate climate change. Australia is particularly vulnerable to climate change impacts. It's already the driest continent on Earth, excluding Antarctica where it's too cold for precipitation. CSIRO and the Met Bureau have examined potential impacts of global warming on climate regimes in Australia. Changes include lower rainfall in the south, and higher in the north, changes to the barrier reef, increased desertification in some areas, etc. Many of these changes will impact on ag agriculture as well as on natural ecosystems and vegetation patterns. While Australia has experienced major changes to these in the past, the issue is the rate of change and the ability of species to adapt.
So having looked at past changes in the climate from an historical perspective, as well as the changes that are occurring in the last 50 to 100 years, the question is, where are we headed now? Currently, CO2 levels are increasing at about 2 to 3 parts per million every year. How fast they will increase depends on the rate of emissions, predominantly from fossil fuel burning, as well as how much is absorbed by the oceans, land, etc. This in turn may be affected by temperatures. As the oceans warm, they can hold less dissolved gas, while changes in land-based vegetation patterns might also reduce the uptake of CO2. These are some of the feedback effects which are difficult to model precisely. Accordingly, the IPCC, or an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, looked at four potential scenarios into the future in terms of CO2 levels, and then looked at what this might mean for the climate system based on a range of climate models. You can see some of the results in the graph above and some of the scenarios, referred to as RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6 and 8.5. That represents the global average increase in temperatures expected by 2100 under different regimes of CO2. Whilst we can expect significant warming under any of the scenarios, the differences between the extreme scenarios as shown above in terms of temperatures and precipitation factors are very significant. They suggest that we could be heading for a dramatically warmer world, 8.5 degrees warming on average by 2100, if we continue the current growth in CO2 emissions. Similarly, there would be major ramifications for sea ice salinity and other characteristics between the different scenarios. This would represent changes to the world's ecosystems within 150 years which dwarf changes in the past occurring over many, many thousands of years. Although sea levels are slow to respond, there would also be an acceleration under the high emission scenarios as land-based ice adds to the thermal expansion of the oceans. This would have very significant consequences for whole countries such as the Maldives or Bangladesh or the Netherlands as well as for low-lying cities everywhere and regions like Florida in the US. It's pretty obvious then that we have a major need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and as soon and as rapidly as possible. We have to keep total warming below 2 degrees from pre-industrial levels to minimise the risk of runaway climate change from the self-reinforcing feedbacks we talked about earlier on. So anything more than 2 degrees does run the risk of climate change going out of control. Given that we've already had 0.8 of a degree rise, that in theory means we have another 1.2 degrees before we reach dangerous climate change. Unfortunately, we already have an additional 0.6 of a degree locked in from the delayed response to past CO2 emissions. So that leaves only 0.6 of a degree left. And 0.3 degrees is likely to result if the Arctic sea ice melts from the albedo effect of reduction of uh, radiation back out to space that the ice forms, that the, the ice con uh, contributes to in the Arctic. Consequently, we really only have 0.3 of a degree left before we actually hit the beginning of the threshold of that 2 degrees safe level. So how do we reduce emissions? Basically, we have to decarbonise energy production and transport. As we mentioned earlier, these account for over 70% of CO2 emissions human-induced. We also have to see whether carbon sequestration, in other words, storing CO2 underground, will work, especially for things like steelworks and cement plants, which produce significant CO2, but for which it's difficult to replace coal or gas as a primary energy source. Later lectures will examine the options in more detail, focusing on transport, which is technically more difficult given the current dependence on oil-based fuels. <laughs>